Why were you so angry? Yeah, Sean Strickland had many reasons to be angry. He may as well have grown up in a psychiatric institution where the lunatics were running his show. We've often heard fighters talking about mental health. This is not that. This is legitimate mental illness. Day in, day out from like my earliest memory, like my dad was nuts. The psychological trauma of like living this life. That's how I grew up, dodging beer cans, like the water was shut off, like. His father was an intimidating figure, a menace who loomed over Sean's entire childhood and kept their house in a state of terror. Every night, dude, I would like, I would go to bed thinking like, my mom's gonna die tonight, you know? His father had substance abuse issues and would routinely explode in a physical and verbal abuse. So, like my dad, once me and my brother got older, he switched from like alcohol, to, like narcotics. Like. A lot of it appeared to revolve around paranoia and controlling behavior, specifically with respect to Sean's mother. So, we can't diagnose the man, but it's possible we're talking about something like borderline personality disorder, which is characterized by these types of paranoid delusions and unstable behavioral patterns. Whatever it was, it made life impossible. Like Sean mentions, his father was on disability. Surprise, surprise. So his mother would work. But that became an issue, because his father would be concerned she was cheating while at work, to support his family. He like was holding my mom, like holding my mom, like in the room saying, you know, like crazy shit. Like, you know, you're, you're probably like banging your boss. You're probably, you know, like your mom's banging our boss. Your mom's doing this, you're doing that. So I look at my dad and I'm like, dad, like, like man, like my mom asked to work. You're on disability, like, you know. Even something as mundane and absolutely necessary as going to work became a war. It sounds like she was basically living in a fucking prison to accommodate his mental illness and his weakness as a man. The result is that Sean saw a lot of things that a kid, or even an adult, shouldn't have to deal with. He gets on top of my mom, like he's strangling her, and he's like, you're gonna die. So I go and I grab the guitar, and I just smack him in the head as hard as I can. And I grab the phone, and I run out, and I call the cops. So it could have been borderline, but to use a less technical term, his father was his scumbag piece of shit bully and just unnecessarily nasty. <sighs> like, let's just say, like, you had something you really loved, like a toy or something. Like, you would come off drunk, break your toy. You know, that's not the most traumatic thing Sean talks about, but it says so much. What type of vindictive, mean-spirited excuse for a father would take away a kid's happiness for just no reason? Clearly, for him, taking away a child's joy was its own reward miserable whenever you experience like things like that day in and day out your brain like it, it biological changes when children are having um, repeated traumatic events there is an overabundance of that stress hormone in the brain and we know that that causes actual damage to the development of the structures of the brain children who have been traumatized particularly from their primary caregiver um, have really disorganized attachment because the person from whom they're going to go to feels safe to learn trust, to learn that the world is a predictable and loving place, is also the person that is um, perpetrating this scary and traumatic event on them. The impact of these types of traumatic events on the developing brain and psychology of a child can be mitigated to some degree if there is one stable, loving parent protecting the child. Now, Sean would credit his mother as being loving. Oh, yeah, I know. I, I, love, I love my mom. Like, she's like the greatest fucking person ever, you know? But she wasn't responsible under the circumstances. Sean has a close bond with her, but it sounds like the post-traumatic stress type bond two soldiers might share coming back from a war. Not the bond of a child and a protective mother. And like, me and my mom are the biggest things. Like, mind you, my mom's probably the reason I'm so fucked up, but like... That's a fair comment because that dysfunctional domestic situation persisted in Sean's life for almost two decades. That's all his formative years. 
Sean spent the critical developmental period of his life in hell, which usually means irreparable damage has been done. We know that adults who in childhood experience six or more adverse events will have a life expectancy that's 20 years less than the average life expectancy. So Sean has described having very justifiable resentment for that lack of appropriate protection from his mother. There was a moment where like, I kind of like had like some like anger towards my mom, like just, you know, like keeping us in that situation for so long. I don't want to judge his mother too harshly. You know, a lot of victims just get beaten down. They live in a state of fear. They suffer from anxiety and depression and feel powerless. She herself had a horrible childhood. I love my mom, she's amazing. I mean, she's terrible, but she's amazing. You know, she grew up in a box car. How do you fix that? Her dad, her dad was a piece of shit. But she wasn't a child here and did have a moral obligation to protect her kids. I mean, they did eventually leave, but if you listen to Sean, it was only after he had physically confronted his father. When I was like 17, one day I wake up to him fighting, right? He like gets in my face, like, I'm your father, you're gonna talk to me, and I'm just like, Day and day, I'm gonna headbutt and break his nose. Like, he falls down, like, crying. And I'll never forget, like, the monster, like, the boogeyman in my life. Just watch him, like, fall to the ground, like, crying, holding his nose. It was like, it was almost disappointing. Like, it was disappointing. I expected so much more from him. You hear that often from kids of abusive fathers. They grow up in a constant state of fear, and it's deflating when they reach the age and size where they can finally stand up to this domineering savage, only for that savage to quickly back down. It can be deflating to realize their abuser had been a coward all along. I mean, Sean would have been carrying decades of rage. This was a confrontation that had been building in his mind for years. He sounded ready to go 12 rounds. But his father threw in a towel in the first exchange. So you can understand his frustration when the whole drawn out nightmare ended in a pathetic whimper rather than a cathartic bang. But my point is, it sounds like it was actually this confrontation which represented a changing of the power dynamics in the household, which really brought the suffering to an end. The cop talked to my dad on pressing charges and then from that day my mom moved out. I moved out with her. In other words, it wasn't his mother who stopped things. Sean had to wait decades until he was old enough to end the abuse himself. And that is just tragic. These dynamics made Sean an angry and vulnerable child looking for a male role model. My grandfather was like this big six, seven, like, you know, kind of like a Southern guy. He just kind of like filled your head with crazy shit. When you're a kid though, you don't see that, you hear war shit. And like that identity like consumed, you know? Like you, you can't have a belief system that is your own when you're in sixth grade. Like someone has to guide you down a path to have that, that belief system. So his grandfather was another worthless piece of shit with some very bad ideas, which I'll come back to. But here you're starting to see the full grotesque image of this horrible human tapestry, the generations of dysfunction at play. His grandfather was a white supremacist, but he was also a world champion level cheater, presumably with everything that entails. You know, jealous women pulling each other's hair out, volatile arguments, screaming in the streets, you know, the cops showing up. I don't need to paint a picture, but worse than all that, he wasn't just cheating. He was fathering many different kids with many different women. Back in the day, like my grandfather, you know, worked at a bar, an avid cheater. My mom has, you know, 20, 30 cheated. siblings. You think he raised all those kids, providing them all with stable environments and happy childhoods? I doubt he was changing any diapers. I'd assume he was largely abandoning them and probably to some horrible circumstances. So this guy was like a one-man factory, just churning out misery and dysfunction. And I would imagine Sean's paternal family wasn't much better. I'm sure his abusive father was himself a victim in his childhood. All this whole thing is, is one miserable generation ruining the next. 
you look at the stats for some of these conditions. Children who have a parent with bipolar disorder, their rates are, of themselves having the illness are increased five to tenfold. So we know that's uh, far and away the biggest risk. Kids of parents with borderline are somewhere between four and 20 times as likely to develop borderline than other kids. So on the surface, that might suggest a very strong genetic component, which there is. But there's also a huge environmental aspect to this elevated risk. Say a kid grows up in a deeply dysfunctional home. A lot of the time these kids develop psychiatric conditions as adults that can in turn make them very unstable people, sometimes completely unfit to be parents. If they do have kids, in many cases because of their illness, they cannot help but recreate the dysfunctional dynamics and unstable conditions that destroyed their own childhood. So it's like a horrible family curse that just gets beaten down through the generations. You know, you've heard the phrase, hurt people hurt people. Well, I think a slight variation would describe what we're talking about here. Broken people break people, and they especially break their kids. Sean described seeing his father on his deathbed after losing a battle with cancer. And Sean mentions that this was almost poetic. I died at 50 something of cancer and miserable, fucking miserable. It's like I actually seen him on his, like when he died. He was in the hospice at my brother's house. And I remember like looking at his like dead old fucked up body. This, re this reflects you like entirely, you know, who you are now. I love the metaphor, but to expand it a little, the cancer didn't die with his father. It's been around for generations. I mean, if you consider just his grandfather's fathering and probable abandoning of like 30 kids and the circumstances those kids likely grew up in, it's very clear that that cancer has metastasized. People are gonna be untangling, are trying to untangle themselves from this family's miserable fucking mess for generations to come. And that is the full extent of this family's cancer. But it gets worse. Another very worrying thing Sean has repeated is to kind of downplay the traumatic nature of his childhood by comparing it favorably to some of the kids around him. Yeah, but I mean, you know, like the, the rough childhood thing, like, man, like everybody has a fucking rough childhood. Like I meet people, like I meet people through my life that made my fucking life look like Disneyland, you know? I let my mom help me out. You know, I my mom, give me, I had more privilege than most. More privilege than most. Now, this is obviously ridiculous. But what's funny is that Sean is making the case that he was actually lucky. He lived a pampered life of privilege compared to some of the kids around him. What he doesn't seem to realize is that this is painting an image of an even more corrosive environment for him. You know, if you grow up in a dysfunctional household, but you're part of a wholesome community, there is some type of compensatory effect. You're gonna benefit by being surrounded by functional families and by an abundance of positive role models. If you grow up in a dysfunctional household, in a community plagued by dysfunction, then that becomes normal. You know, where are the positive forces to guide you away from destructive behavior? I had no positive role models in my life. I grew up on 1990s Hollywood. But as a man, as I grow up and I start making more money, I look back at all these influences I had and how detrimental to me. I lied, I cheated on my girlfriend. I've done so much bad shit, bro, that as a man, I have to look myself in the mirror and say, I did this and why did this happen? Why did this happen? I had happened because I had no real positive male role models in my life. Being a piece of shit was encouraged. So Sean says he's seen worse, as if that kind of downplays his childhood trauma. But actually, it very likely exacerbated the whole thing. You know, they say it takes a village to raise a child, but it sounds like Sean was living in Psychoville, crazy -fornia. And so, having been raised on a toxic cocktail of deplorable role models, 
It all took a very predictable toll on a young Sean. You know, there absolutely is an alternative reality where you're watching a Sean Strickland video on YouTube, but it's on Jim Can Swim. I was really fucking angry. It's funny, like, here's an American History X. And, like, that's who I wanted to be, one of those guys. And that's, like, I thought they were so fucking cool. And, you know, like, I would walk out, I would, I would walk down the street, you know, just with a knife or, like, a rock, hoping to kill somebody. I, I just knew that if I could just kill a human being, it would make me feel good in a short time. But I was on a path to where I was going to act it out. Once you start fantasizing enough about it, you start putting yourself in situations to act out of fantasy. I would put myself in like victim scenarios, hoping that someone would just want to victimize me. Would give me an opportunity. Probably either been a serial killer or been in jail. It felt so good to fucking hate something. Guy sounded like a maniac, just a walking menace with a chip on his shoulder and decades of pent up rage. So MMA was a godsend for this guy, gave him a constructive avenue to direct that energy and appeared to help Sean with his trauma. Uh, my mom took me to uh, Empire MMA with a guy named Paul Guerrero. Like, I never, like, I don't think I ever really experienced happiness until that day. So you gotta understand, like, you, you live your whole life in a certain mindset, and then you do something, and then you're just like, this is what normal people experience? I, I love this. Like, I remember, like, crying, like, after I got done sparring, like, I even know when I think about it, it makes my eyes water. Children who have been traumatized. Psychological trauma of, like, living, like, life. We know that adults have been in a hard And I started training when I was around, like, 14, 15, and it was, like, with this therapy, you know? It was, like, just helping me with all my issues, like, seeing the light. It also helped him confront some of his grandfather's ideas. Like a lot of people who helped me, like especially the MMA, Mexicans, black guy, and they would like grew up in a shitty neighborhood. I, I started realizing I have a lot in common with you guys. Mm -hmm. And you also feel shame now. Your entire life you've been like spouting off this rhetoric again on being a kid. And next thing you know, the people that are helping you out, but they're not even fucking white. So it's like also another shameful thing that you have to like come to terms with. So Sean says MMA saved his life. One other thing very likely saved his life, and this just cannot be overstated, was that he managed to sidestep alcohol. You know, you can see this go either way with kids of alcoholics. They're often drawn down the same grim path as their parents. But on the other hand, they can sometimes be so repulsed that they sidestep the whole thing. A contrary belief, I've never done a drunk in my life. But my father, abusive alcoholic, drank. Everything about him I hated. Yes. Everything about him I hated. And then you combine my racist origins of like, you know, more ethnic people do drugs. Then I became more of like adamantly against it. Adamantly against it. This is a big one. If you take someone with the issues he described and you toss booze into the mix, that's an explosive combination. Very possible he's dead or in jail. And that's not an exaggeration. Almost 50% of homicides are committed by people under the influence of alcohol, as are almost 40% of homicide victims. What an indictment of the effects of alcohol on people's judgment. Strickland was wise to avoid it. He was already out there looking for trouble, trying to put himself in explosive confrontations. Well, very few things will invite chaos into your life quicker than booze. Add alcohol into his situation, and it's very likely he'd have found exactly what he was looking for. He would have found some trouble with a capital T and could easily be waiting for some justice with a capital P.
You know, I really haven't even touched on Sean's MMA career, so I'm not going to finish this with him hoisting the belt over his head. But there obviously is a huge personal triumph in the things I've discussed, and that's in breaking a cycle of abuse. His family's cancer, its primary mechanism of metastasis, has been through generations of destructive, negligent parenting. One fucked up generation victimizes the next, and that disease thrives and multiplies. But not to Sean. Sean never drank alcohol because he was repulsed by his father's behavior. He had some psychotic, sinister thoughts and explosive rage running through his head, but MMA helped him temper and control these ideas. And so he stuck with it. You know, rage, and especially righteous rage, can be a very addictive emotion. But Sean just wanted a way to put that whole thing to rest. And he also buried his grandfather's bad ideas when reality confronted him with evidence to the contrary. I mean, I'm sure he experienced all kinds of cognitive dissonance and did some Olympic level mental gymnastics, but in the end, he accepted that those ideas were not only wrong, but were utterly destructive. You know, people often like, people often think that like the world is racist, like it's not. Like when you're racist, like you don't get ahead in life. Like, you're outcast and you look at like the fucking weirdo. Like there's no privilege from being like racist. So I, I resented him a big majority of my life for, for, you know, filling my head with that. So Sean Strickland was horribly burdened as a boy. As a man, he had to wield the ax himself and try to nail the coffin shut on all that nasty shit. 